I was trying to think of the title. And uh, women plus innovation equals win. This is sort of my conceit. OK, so as always, a person who I really respect who's a great speaker said, you tell people what you're going to tell them. You tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. And so that's what I'm going to do. And by the way, that lady um, is a phenomenal speaker. I, I might actually mention her later. Her name's Carla Harris. She was the first woman vice president, and Morgan Stanley, she's one of the best speakers I've heard in my life. And I think I'm not bad, and this woman was amazing. Go look, up her on, go look her up online, Carla's Pearls. OK, so intro. OK, I can't stand up here. I'm sorry, I just like feel strange. Um, so well, welcome to WeCode 2016. Woohoo! Boy, you guys are nerds. I wouldn't have gotten up out of bed to be here on a Saturday morning at 9.30 when I was in school. OK, well, so who am I and why would you care? Well, I'm the first and only woman technical fellow at Microsoft. I hate the name. I argued for technical goddess. But the, uh, other, the 20 guys didn't like that. Uh, it basically means I'm a vice president. I just, the, there's about 200 people total on the exec staff of Microsoft of a company of 115,000. The only difference is I don't have to sign like NDAs and do marketing nonsense, which I wouldn't have done anyway, so I think they were wise to, to do that. I'm five feet tall, 105 pounds plus or minus, <laughs> and 45 years old worth of uh, mostly concentrated awesomeness. Uh, I am notorious for like wearing cat pajamas uh, in ship room when things get stressful. I, I mean, like full tail, paws, ears. There was an article about it. <laughs> I've gotten so much flack on that one. Um, dog pajama wearers were really upset. I'm catist. Um, uh, there was a book a long time ago called Microsurfs by Douglas Copeland. I actually am the inspiration for the character Carla in there. It's a character who eats flat food that they shove under her door. I actually, it was notes. People used to come knock on my door all the time, and I'm like, I'm trying to get my job done. Push little flat notes under the door if you want to talk to me. Uh, I have a developer of many things you probably used. Uh, I was 19 when I did the file open and file save dialogues. So if you use Windows, and those are still around, and I'm sorry. I was an intern. I did not know what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> font picker in particular, because this is a, a dialogue, like if you use PowerPoint, and it like, takes forever for the damn thing to come up. It's because it's enumerating all of the fonts on your system and rendering them. And when I did that, there was like only one font. So it was really fast, and now it's slow. Uh, remote desktop, all, most of the like start menu, uh, back in Windows 95, the 3D look and feel. class of 91, and I'm a completely accidental techie, okay? So what do I do? I'm the director of engineering for Windows Fundamentals, which means performance, reliability, power, telemetry, feedback, analytics, tools, compatibility, update, insider program, meaning I'm a little busy. It's all the cool macho stuff. I run a team of 200 million engineers. It's about an $80 million a year operational budget, but a large other chunk, probably another 40 million, is kind of hidden in corporate stuff, like benefits, so I don't see it. I boss around about 6,000 or so other people who don't always understand that they work for me, even though they don't work for me. Um, I, and mostly what I architect now is I architect civilizations. Civilizations that, and environments that are great teams that sustainably and durably build great stuff. Okay? And, uh, and they thrive. And uh, you know, the mark of a really great civilization is if I move on, that that group continues to grow and do cool stuff. And I have. I would almost call them like my grandchildren uh, that in other parts of the company and in startups that, you know, long time ago worked for me, and I, I kind of take comfort in that. Okay, well, I want to say some thanks. First of all, Harvard 91, this is my 25th anniversary, and I know I don't look a day over 30 hex, right? Okay. Uh, um, and the QRR. So I don't know if you guys still have this at Harvard, but the quantitative reasoning requirement, it was this thing that you had to check your mail. In my era, it was on a VAX. And I totally failed it. And they wanted me to waste like a course, and I was broke, by the way, on taking like some math for dummies class. I was so annoyed. So I'm like, what's the other option? The other option was C you know, CS, like a real computer science class. And they're like, but you don't want to do that. And I went, oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> and it was hard. I almost dropped out. I could not get little triangle made of stars to line up. And then we got to <laughs> recursion, and I don't know, it just clicked. I uh, also want to thank Matthew's house. My freshman dorm was in the north, fifth floor. Matthew's north, they, they never turned the heat. I was freezing ass cold in that building. And uh, it made studying really attractive. Like, I knew I couldn't sit in my bed because I'd fall asleep, so I hung out in the Science Center all the time. Uh, Harry Lewis, who's still here, I have his 19, actually 1983 Theory of Computation book, him and Papa Dimitriou from MIT. 
Uh, anyway, I got an A plus in that class. I did the extra credit. I got the integer underflow, overflow. And I think the ultimate thing, it was like 68,000 assembler for a C interpreter of Lisp with an ELISA programmer. It's so really useful. <laughs> and last, I want to thank all the people that put this thing together and all of you for being here. So a nice round of applause for Abigail, Billy, Anna, Harvard Wicks. And a bunch of you who are coming to Microsoft in the summer and a bunch of you who declined our internship offer and that's okay too. <laughs> You're gonna really regret that after my speech. Okay, so my career path. Uh, well, there's this little movie that came out called uh, The Force Awakens in whom the main character is a woman and J.J. Abrams, you freaking didn't make an action figure of her. Okay, so like shame on you dude. So anyway, I would say homage to Carrie Fisher and a little bit of an apology, but not so much maybe to George Lucas and J.J. Abrams. So I kind of think of my career as sort of Star Wars episodes. There was the prequels, Jar Jar Binks, we're just gonna kind of skip over that. Uh, a New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and then The Force Awakens. Okay, so the prequels. Well, I had a really scrappy and nomadic childhood. We moved probably like two, three times a year. And I was always the misfit. And I got really good at learning how to kind of talk to avoid getting kind of beaten up. Uh, but I also knew that no matter how bad it got, like, we're probably going to move. So uh, it took a lot of uh, fear away from me. I grew up watching Star Trek reruns and Bugs Bunny. So when every other kid was learning how to speak in Spanish from Sesame Street, I was learning Klingon, you know, like, knock, clock. Okay. I was the tallest kid in fourth grade. I had my growth spurt early. So I was like this Godzilla. In four, actually, I was going to be the hope of the bas you know, St. Mary's Cathedral Elementary School basketball champs. You can see the nuns have this in their head. And then I never grew. But I still have like a, in my head that I'm like a big person. I went to Harvard at 17. I knew what I was going to do. I was going to be an archaeologist, biochemist, spy, science fiction, historical writer, uh, mathematician, and maybe rock musician on the side. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up in CS completely by accident because I failed this class. And I was so broke. And by the way, math and computer science books are not cheap. I know you guys can, I think, do some stuff with the Kindle now. I was giving blood and taking psych tests for money. And so not only was I was broke, I was anemic, and I needed therapy, for which I could <laughs> <laughs> And you'd sit there going, like, okay, this math textbook's 150 bucks, and there's a psych experiment. And you could just tell, you're like, oh, this one's probably gonna involve like electrodes, because it's like $100. <laughs> it was me and the international students. So you should never trust a single psychology study that comes out of Harvard, you should be completely skeptical about. It's probably the same 17, you know, broke people like me who took it. <laughs> okay, well, so I decided to get my act together and get a job, because I didn't have a driver's license. I only worked like in my town grocery store. And February 89, I went to the Career Center. I, this was the investment banking era where you look like poofy sleeve, poofy, you know, shoulder pads and bow ties. And I thought I was interviewing with Goldman Sachs. I show up, some woman whisks me into a room and asks me all kinds of strange questions. Like, how would you estimate the death rate in Boston without a newspaper? You guys would say, well, I'd go look it up on the internet and go Google it. And I was like, well, I think I'd look at the obituary. Anyway, they just asked me these really unusual questions. And the next thing I know, they're like, well, you want to go to dinner at Legal Seafoods with us? And my answer was, well, I don't have any money. And they're like, no, no, we're going we're gonna to pay. And I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> I show up, and I'm like, so, like, where am I going to live in New York City? And they're like, we're Microsoft. I'm like, Microsoft? Like, who the hell is Microsoft? OK, but I like how these people roll. Like, they're buying me food. They send me plane tickets. They put me up in temp housing. And so I showed up in 89, May of 1989. I was going to work on Word for Windows 1.0, which was about to ship. Yeah, well, it was about to ship for about two years. <laughs> And so they weren't going to let interns touch anything. All of the bugs were in printing and text formatting, which is pretty much the hardest part of a word processor. So I had all this time on my hands. And uh, there was this other thing called Windows. And Windows was there. The company, there were four buildings in Microsoft. I was the girl in building three, besides the receptionist. And Windows was the thing that was going to take bullets. It was just there to like be a shield until OS2 or Linux or something you know, like took over. They could not get the time of day. They were begging, were, please, God, like, fix your push buttons. They look hideous. So since I was an intern and expendable, <laughs> red shirt, uh, no offense uh, to the people wearing red. And um, I was like, OK. And I, they finally, they're like, well, if you're going to file, find these problems. Who are you, T-Laura B? So I'm like, oh my god, my, my internship, I'm like, I, I don't want to get fired. It's like free soda. And they're like, well, come on over. And not only free soda, they had free Lipton cup of soup. And then so that plus the milk in the fridge, I lived on that whole summer. And I don't know why, but people with 170 IQs cannot close cooler doors properly. So half the time, it was like food poisoned. 
<laughs> or soda and poison, but still, it was great. And also, ethnic food and 24-hour grocery stores. I grew up in Connecticut. There's nothing open past 8 p.m. in Connecticut. Um, anyway, and so I worked on Windows through Windows 95. It was just awesome. And I tried to go back to school, and I couldn't. I thought I was like this establishment person. I was like the best of following the rules. I was a Dieter scholar freshman year, and I had an A minus or above average. And I came back here, and I'm like, wait, you guys are going to charge me 50 bucks to change my concentration? Wait, I have to wait in line? I'm like, customer service. Somehow I turned into a rebel, and uh, I just couldn't do it. So I dropped out. I tried to convince my mom she'd buy me a car because I was saving her two years of tuition. That didn't really, <laughs> it doesn't work, by the way, just to, just to say, <laughs> like, don't follow my. Uh, my rules. Uh, and then the accessibility of the internet happened after Windows 95. So then I said the empire strikes back. So we grew like crazy in the mid 90s after Windows 95 and we had no plan for it. Like the company, I mean we went from like, I don't know, to like where I felt like I knew everybody to 50,000 people. And then we had lots of duplication and you can imagine if you don't have a plan in organi for organization, you end up with bureaucracy. And I became a lead, a dev lead, and I was a dev manager. And then I was a GM, which meant I had like dev and test and PM under me. And I did it mostly because my peers were doing it. I remember being asked, hey, do you want to be the GM of this product? And I didn't really want to be, but I was like, wait, but they just made this moron guy? Yeah, OK, sure. And I realized I absolutely hate expense reports and that kind of shit. So <laughs> I didn't really think it through. And at the same time, Microsoft kind of realized we've got eight versions of everything. And we can't hire enough people to do one well because we have to compete. You know, Google and Netscape and things that started. So it was a consolidation phase. And it made total sense, but it wasn't what I signed up to do. And, uh, you know, like I never thought I'd be at this Microsoft place anyway. So I left in 2000. And for six years, I got it around the world. I spent a bunch of time in Nepal. It turns out anybody, if they spend three hours a day in the gym doing more than just occasional, like, fast uh, bicep curls can get kind of fit. I could do one-arm chin-ups at one point in my life. It was awesome. I, did, uh, I taught English in Nepal. I still remember how to order uh, beer, like Yauda Tulo Chiso San Miguel. That's another tall, cold beer. Um, I learned how to cook. I got into marathoning. Uh, I read most of the classics. I really have read Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, one, two, and three. I've read the Iliad and the Odyssey. I read Dickens, beginning to end. Anyway, it was fun. I dabbled in architecture and the law. I thought, oh, maybe I'll get a law degree without going to law school. And then I realized I don't really want to practice the law. So I even took a circus acrobatics class. I don't say it was any good, but it was kind of fun. You know, trapeze and an Olympic trampoline. You can hurt yourself, by the way, on an Olympic trampoline. You get a pretty high, and especially if it's in a floor like this and you land wrong, not good. Uh, and then I was at a startup for three years called Overcast Media. We just broke even. It was a commentary platform, so you can make comments like Super Bowl annotation, and you could attach it to any video anywhere, like YouTube. And uh, we never really kind of got anywhere with it. It was advertisers that were interested, and we just didn't really want to create fancy spam. We broke even because we licensed our corporate logo to Amazon, and the spinning O, if you've ever seen that on Amazon streaming video, that was us. They just changed it. So the, the money's dried up there. And so we folded the company in spring 2009, and like the next day, Microsoft called. Because Microsoft was like, does not like to lose old-time Microsoft people. So, so return of the Jedi. <laughs> I returned to Microsoft in the summer of 2009 to work on Windows Phone 7, yet another mobile reset. And phone was like this, or mobile was kind of this joke at Microsoft. You could just tell. It was the place where like hand-me-down code went to die, that where people didn't really feel good about throwing it in the trash, so instead kind of leave it at the Salvation Army kind of a thing. And it wasn't that the people were bad. You could just tell we didn't take it seriously. And uh, when I heard who had gone there, like Joe Belfiore, who had been my program manager in Windows 95, uh, I was like, oh, okay. And I knew, I had in my mind it was going to be an adventure. And I think the adventure travel and the circus acrobatics, all this other stuff that had nothing to do with computer science really served me well. Because before I even started, my job had changed. <laughs> so uh, we worked on, we shipped Windows Phone 7, 7.1, 7 Windows Phone 8. I owned the buttery smooth user interface. It was graphics, you know, D3D all the way up to the shell. All about, on really old hardware, making it really smooth scrolling and stuff like that. And then we had a reorg in the summer of 2012, and there was a musical chairs phenomenon, and I was left without a seat. So I went over to, at the time, which was the B team for Windows Phone. Ah, oh, servicing that commercialization stuff, which turns out to be actually the art of succeeding in mobile, like you know, dealing with mobile operators, making sure you work in different markets, getting the right hardware, getting the right software on there, and configuration. And my boss at the time, before I moved over, literally was in tears. He's like, you're throwing your career away. 
Like, I can't believe you're going to do this. Like, ha. I mean, literally, he was like crying. And I'm like, well, that's how I want to run my own gig. Well, turned out, I didn't think this was the B team. No team I'm on is a B team. Uh, a team people are people who make anybody around them A team. And so anyone who talks about A team and B team, you know, you should be skeptical of, including me. Uh, anyway, so I decided, no, what this is really about is not like fixing random bugs so that this other group of aristocratic, you know, down Abbey upstairs people can just do what they feel like. This is about growing market share. And it was a fun time. Actually, quadrupled market share. We had over 20% in some markets. Uh, Mexico was a huge success. We swooped in there, cut out uh, Apple. And uh, Carlos Slim, quite a character, a scary man beside me. <laughs> like, if you have bugs, you're like, he could kill you. Uh, OK, anyway, so that was fun. And I got promoted to distinguished engineer. So I was the first woman DE at Microsoft, uh, which these things you have to think of, they're not roles. They're a little bit like Order of the British Empire. It's kind of a special recognition of people who are what would be partner band level 70. It doesn't mean anything, but it's complicated. It was just before the Super Bowl that the Seattle Seahawks won, and I got to go to the Super Bowl, and I sat in row six. And I remember the first play where Peyton Manning fumbled. This, and I was like, this just it doesn't get better than that, right? Sorry for those of you who are Patriots fans, but it was a really awesome time in Seattle. Um, and then Windows 10 really kind of got into gear, and I called it the Death Star at the time. And uh, I just was fed up because I, I just kind of watched all the work that I had done in phone. Just felt like it was going to fall away. So I, you know, my boots were made for walking, and I walked. And I made sure everyone saw me walk. And uh, I left the division. I went to OneDrive SharePoint for a while. Thought, well, Microsoft strategy is mobile first, cloud first. I think I understand mobile, but it doesn't feel like it's first right now. And Windows, I know nothing about the cloud ex except for getting rained on in Seattle and Gore-Tex is helpful. So did that. Anyway, and so we, I got reorg pretty much every other week. And I learned what I wanted to know <laughs> about the cloud, <laughs> which is, it's networking and some storage. Like, how hard can it be? Anyway, uh, and I decided, you know what? Windows is my homeland. This is the place I'm going to. My homeland's in trouble. And you either decide to double down as a citizen or you emigrate. And I'm like, OK, well, if this is my homeland, I'm, the way to like, help and change is to do it from the inside. And I had gotten some perspective. So I returned in the spring. I'd say I left a frustrated Princess Leia for a distant rebel base. <laughs> it was cold. <laughs> And I returned uh, as General Organa, helped ship Windows 10. I took over fundamentals just as we shipped. Uh, partly, and I took it because partly nobody else would say yes to the job. Hey, we're about to go ship an operating system, and we want to get to 500 million users you know, in a couple years. And you know it's going to be a crazy wild ride with upgrades and, and all sorts of stuff. And everybody else is like, hell no, I wouldn't touch that job. So I went, sure. <laughs> and uh, by the way, that's what got me promoted to TF in the fall. Um, and right now, I'm building a healthy federation and not a Sith empire, or, uh, and that's what motivates me. Fundamentals in particular, any problem in culture or tech or all of the above or marketing or conception, whatever it is, it ripples, and I, my team sees it. Teams overbook. They don't get to fix enough bugs at the end. Teams don't know what they're doing. Like, you know, the product's in trouble. People do a lot of work, and it turns out users don't like it. We see it through the feedback system. So it's really an interesting hub spot to be. And I am actively recruiting and training Padawans to uh, join the good side of the force. So, like you. So, in conclusion, because I don't want to bore you too much uh, first thing in the morning, when you could actually leave. <laughs> um, okay, so here's some learnings, and I don't want to preach at you, but these are, I was trying to think of, like, what do I wish I had known when I was your age? Um, you were smarter than I was at your, you know, young, tender years. OK, so some stuff for you. And I think it's particularly relevant to women in tech, but I don't think these things are unique to women. OK, power. Power, it's taken. OK, it's not given. Nobody's going to come up to you and go, arise, I anoint you, Lady Billy of the empire. Here's a little silver platter with a wonderful project on it. It's perfect. There's no problems. It's not going to happen. OK? And by taking it, I don't necessarily mean like a military invasion. But I mean, you get authority by acting like you have it. When I went back to Microsoft in 2009, I showed up like the first day in Shiproom, in global Shiproom. And I was probably wearing a pink sweater. Nobody knew who I was. In fact, half the room probably thought I was the admin of my boss. And somebody said, well, like, why don't we just like, check this directly into Maine? And I went, no, that's stupid. You don't do that. You got to make sure it builds. That's just going to waste time. And everyone went, go, yeah, OK, you're right. And then they're like, who is that person? Okay. And also, you can't be interrupted 
if you don't let yourself be interrupted. I think this is a particularly big topic right now. You hear about cultures and being talked over. You, if you let yourself be talked over, shame on you. Stand up, wear bright red lipstick. Or do things like I have done, which is, hello, yeah, I'm a blah, 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 blah. Stand up on the table and go, all right, hey, everybody, my turn now. And say it with a smile. It works, by the way. Or um, I remember I was, I think I was explaining something and someone just started interrupting and I just kept talking and he got like this weird look on his face and I went, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you because I was still talking. Okay. Right. <laughs> I also interrupt people a lot because I talk fast. Um, and I think, you know, something that we also lose sight of, especially in tech, is that feelings are data too. People are data and code too. You know, algorithms, we think about algorithms for big data, algorithms for people, flows of information and connectivity, they're one and the same, just like there's multiple variants of the traveling salesman problem, optimization in people space, optimization in tech space. But more than that, like feelings aren't, if you reason yourself, your, your feelings out, you'll be really sorry. Like, you know, your brain says X, but your heart says Y. If your heart says Y, there's something there. You should dig in. And I think particularly in tech, sometimes, you know, people are attracted to it because you're like, ah, oh, computers, like, they're just so much simpler. You know, I don't have to deal with all that drama. Yeah, well, that's not true. I, I'll tell you what, I never knew that Microsoft in, in the tech industry, it would be like an ongoing episode of Dynasty all the time. <laughs> like, Mark Andreessen hates Steve Jobs with a passion, you know, okay. Um, success and failure, okay? We tend to talk about success and failure in the moment, like a zero or one, and that's just like so crazy wrong. Those are in unbelievably long-term judgments, and they can only be made with distance and perspective. And, I'm, and I, the Greeks were smart about this. They sort of had this concept that, ancient Greeks, that you walked backwards into the future, maybe with glimpsing over your shoulder, but it wasn't until a person actually died, Themistocles, that you could roll his life out like a carpet and then kind of look at the weft and the warp. And you might completely change your mind about that person once you had. And I think the same is true. If you looked at World War I, Depending from what vantage point, you would say, huge failure. Oh, success. Oh, crash of the 20s, failure. You know, leading to World War II, huge failure. Now, okay, you know. So the point is that, like, if you sit there in the moment and you're just like, oh, this is a fail, you're going to, that is the best way to fail, okay? You can't succeed without failing. I wish we could practice failing more. I mean, local fails. I wish we'd come up with a better word for it. And I think so much of things people do that they're afraid to do because they're worried they're going to look stupid or they're worried that they're going to fail in public, that is how you fail, truly fail. Being wrong is not a failure. Making an error is not a failure. Having a judgment that you made and it didn't turn out, that's not a failure. Not trying, that's a fail. Um, and I think to be great, it takes a huge amount of energy. It's called special tech relativity. It's like trying to get to the speed of light. And it, some of that energy, it literally has to come from matter of your heart and your soul. Okay? So on that note, job number one is to be happy in your job. If you're not happy in your job, you're never going to have that energy that it takes to be great. Okay? And we don't talk about this. And if you're not happy, just, you can do something about it. And at the end, you, know, you guys are incredibly valuable and going to be fought after employees. You can walk. Okay? You want to tell your management that you're really not happy and you've said it and you've said it and you've said it. The way you really let them know you're not happy is you don't take it. You move on. If you take it, and people just assume you're yapping and whining. Um, be yourself. I'll tell you what. I really, I think I tried to hide when I was your age. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share something, and I'm not proud of it, but it's the truth. I avoided all women events in my first round at Microsoft because I was a real programmer. I was good. I wasn't going to go hang out with those other people and, like, what, talk about People Magazine and fingernail polish and stuff. How insulting, right? And in retrospect, I mean, I don't think that that was what was in the top of my head, but I think that that was what was here. And I'll tell you what, that is probably the surest sign of minority and insecurity think, right? As though it's a zero-sum game, like we're two sheriffs in the town, there can only be one of us, okay? And I had no community. And I didn't really think about that community, you know, it's a shared bank account, you give and you take both. I just avoided and, uh, and I was trying to hide. I don't know who I thought I was trying, how I was going to hide. I mean, like everybody in the, I, if I sneeze, pretty much everyone at Microsoft knows, you know, because like I, I don't know why I thought I was going to come across like a guy. I tried to be a better guy. 
than some of the guys. So if they went to bed at two, I was going to go to bed at three and fix a couple more bugs. It was just silly. And it was a huge waste of energy. Okay? Seriously, we just talked about how much energy it takes to be great. You waste energy worrying about what people think about you or trying to be someone you're not. It's ludicrous. It's like putting all your energy to the front shields instead of the warp drive of the Starship Enterprise. And the second I stopped caring or I just decided to be myself, I don't know. I think it's also I relaxed. It's stressful to be around people who are kind of uptight, right? It's like I just kind of got chill, and I don't know. It just it worked. And the thing is, let's say that being stressed and uptight had worked, or being somebody that I wasn't. What was the point of that anyway? Are you really successful if you fooled up everybody into something about who you aren't? So think about that one. Um, and this is another really key one: innovation. It's by definition a deviation from the normal. Okay. So misfits in tech, there's no such thing. There is no fit. And but you, this audience, who better to be innovators? Okay, Steve Jobs used to say, "What think different? You don't have to try to think different. You are different. Just by being yourselves, you're actually going to be the best innovator, innovation source around." So um, I was really fortunate that when I started, there was no. It was like I was like the island of lost toys, broken toys. There was no stereotype. Other than maybe not bathing in T-shirts, but um, and so that was really a wonderful thing. And I, you know, I want to plant that seed in your head that misfits, quote unquote, make the best innovators. Also, they are wrong. Sixty-six, at least sixty-six and two-third percent of the time, I can tell you that the things I have done that have been the most impactful in my life and my career, there was a group of people like literally trying to grab onto my ankles. And tell me, don't do it! Oh my God, wait! You're gonna quit? You just got promoted to DE. You're gonna walk away from like a 150-person group, and you're gonna go be an individual contributor programmer over in OneDrive SharePoint? Are you crazy? What? You're gonna leave Microsoft? You're gonna go do circus acrobatics? Are you nuts? Those are the things that have absolutely worked out. Now I'm a natural contrarian at heart, but I think there's something about that. Again, innovation is a deviation from the norm. It always looks weird and strange, and I also think the people. Sometimes the people who are the most adamant, like telling you not to do something, it's about them and it's not it's not about you. It's like you're challenging their view of how the world should be. Okay, uh, and by the way, you know you best. Of course, one in ten times you really are about to fall into you know one take one step back and fall into a canyon. <laughs> so you got to figure out what those moments are. But seriously, I just I, I'm at this place now where if a bunch of people tell me, oh God, no, I like want to go the opposite direction. Um, you know, great tech. Tech is a terrible phrase. Computer science is a terrible phrase. It sounds boring. No wonder people don't want to major in this stuff. It's about making things and solving problems for people, and we've lost sight of that. Like tech has a way of gadgets taking over your life and turning, you know, sucking you into a black hole. Okay, where you're just like trapped in infinity, falling into the event horizon. Great tech is actually a wormhole, or it should be. It lets you get around the limits of space time. Think about adaptive technology for people who are blind. Okay, or accessibility, or mobility—you being able to do what you want, where you want to do it. Okay, that's a wormhole, not a black hole. And also, number six. This goes back to the "no one's going to anoint you." Say, arise, President Hillary. Okay, I had to just work that in the speech. I mean, I want to say President Hillary so bad. It's not even funny. And I've already decided what country I'm moving to if it's President Trump instead. Sorry to work in the politics, but it's true. Um, and uh, and that is no knock on Bernie Sanders. I know that there's some big, huge, fake. Bruhaha about young women and young people versus middle-aged ladies like me. I think that's just a tempest in a teapot. But the point is that every time you have a problem or an annoyance or a mess, that's a business opportunity, because the most valuable thing on the planet is time. Your life is finite. Okay, time and happiness. Anything that gives you time back, or makes you happier, adds to your convenience. Is something you pay for. It gets back. It's kind of like the virtual version of John Locke, and you know, theory from the state of nature. Uh, and so, those are businesses. So every time you're just annoyed or pissed off, or you're like, God, I can't believe I have to wait in line for two hours to get my study card signed. There's a business there. Now it might not make any money, but there's something there. Okay. So I have some homework for you, and you're like, Oh God, I come to some conference on a Saturday, and no one told me there's going to be some homework. No, okay, kidding.、Um, take a martial arts class. I was so stupid in my first, you know, 30 years of my life. 
The only reason I belonged to the gym was I got $8.33 back on my paycheck. It was a stay fit credit, which is kind of ironic since I never stepped foot in the gym, right? Um, I thought you could be like really smart or you could be athletic. You couldn't be both. It's like you only got so many points in a super, you know, in one of these adventure game things. I wish I had known how much physical confidence bleeds over into the personal realm. Because I used to kind of like, you'd be one of these people kind of like walk in a meeting and kind of like this. And, you know, basically I'm wearing a kick me sign. If I kind of like, um, can I like, um, it's okay if I like ask a question? If you do that to me, I'm going to be like, well, you probably know more than I do, and if you're that tentative about it, it's probably for good reason, right? Um, I wish I had known that, like, knowing I could hurt you with my thumb, right, would change how I would negotiate. You know, like, talking is great. You should try to talk and negotiate 95% of that time. But then there's that other 5% of the time where knowing you can solve the problem with the fist, or at least looking like you can, you know, like, like what was a, a ratatouille, the guy with the thumb? You just get really mad, you twitch your, you know, eyes twitch, and you just kind of go like that. And, uh, and people, they, they behave differently. Uh, I, Animal Planet is probably the single most useful thing you can pay attention to and watch, I swear to God. Um, another one would be, try an improv comedy class. You know, there's lots of public speaking things you can do. You can do Toastmasters, that's all great. Improv comedy, it's funny. It learn, teaches you how to kind of relax a little bit and roll with the punches. And also, when you're in a meeting and people are just like, you can feel the tension raising and it's the, you know, budding of the heads or the roaring of the hippos, you just sort of make a joke and it just has a way of like people's thinking, very thin, you know, part of your brain is actually devoted to thinking and the rest of it is that hundred millions of years of evolution of being an animal. But um, it just kind of like, it stops and people can listen again. And, uh, and also life is funny, it is. You know, as, as much as when you're miserable in your job, or the people you work with, how it, it can take its toll on your health. The, the point is, it's not Syria, okay? It's not Ebola, okay? It's not starvation. It's not war-torn violence. So put things in perspective, right? Um, also, terraform. Environments are not given. You can shape an environment and a job around you like a pair of jeans. I will freely admit that when you have 200 people, minions who work for you, and a personal assistant, it is easier to terraform. But you can do it at a local level too. Nothing, there's no rule. Like I just started bringing, I hate to bake. I hate cooking because I hate cleaning up, okay? I just started baking cookies. Guess what, if you have like cookies in your office, people will come to you. <laughs> they will figure out who you are, and instead of you going to them and wasting your time, they will stop by your office, okay, and ask, ask you for things, it, it really works. Um, and I think also refuse to worry about what other people think about you. You know what the truth is? They don't. I'm wandering down the hall. I might have a frown on my face. I'm thinking about the fact that my cat is at the vet and I've got to like figure out how to get, pick the cat up and deal with traffic. And um, I think worrying about what other people think about you is this strange mix of narcissism and insecurity. Okay, when I was your age, if George Clooney had called me up on the phone, actually Benedict Cumberbatch had called me up on the phone <laughs> and said, Laura, I can't do a British accent. Would you like to come with me to the south of France for a weekend? I would have been like, oh God, I didn't shave my legs yet. Okay, I can't do it. I can't do it. <laughs> now I would be like, I've been waiting for your phone call for five years. What took you so long? No, okay. <laughs> Sorry. He's married now. He's dead to me. He's off my list. <laughs> and then also, Leonard Nimoy passed away a year ago, and I got like a thousand. I know. I told my mom, Mom, I hate to break it to you, but you're not going to be a grandma now. So it's a shame. Okay, and then go make something you want to use, right? That makes it personal. You have skin in the game. You know how to evaluate it, but you can't find. That's what uh, tech. That's what all these tech startups are doing. The good ones, you know. Unlike if you really, really want to make an app that says yo or bro or go or do or whatever, fine. It's something you want. Go for it. I'm not. Uh, you know, I have my own opinions about what that's going to add to the world, but if it makes your heart sing. Have at it. Okay, and then my final extra credit. So this is an extra credit assignment. Um, we need a better name. We got to counteract bro grammar. Bra grammar, I don't think is <laughs> is right. I don't know. Women evader. Women evader. It's like too many syllables. Let's come up with a cool, catchy name. Preferably like one syllable, not too many letters, uh, that describes women in tech. Wit. I don't know. And uh, may the female force be with you. And the other force be with you with the rest of you guys in the audience, who, by the way, are pretty rock and awesome for being here. Are they not? Yeah.
Here's to the men. And also, I'm laughing because March is uh, Women's Month, and there's a Women's Day, and I'm like, okay, finally we got a month. Like, can we get 6.5 months? Isn't that like the population? You know, okay. All right, so now I'm going to open it up to questions. I actually kind of went faster than I thought I was going to go. I, when I practiced this, it took me like two hours to get through the speech. Come on, you can ask me anything. If I can't answer, I'll tell you I can't answer, but what's it like to be at Microsoft? It's a really big company. Hello. Hi. Uh, so what have you done? It, I, there's this phenomenon when a woman like brings up an idea and then like someone else then says it, they get credit for it. So have you had that like experience and what have you done to like overcome it? Okay, and sorry, what's your name? Uh, Katie. Okay, Katie said, have I ever had a moment where I had an idea and I said something in the meeting and people just kind of kept marching on and then later some guy goes, I think we should come up with a name for women programmers. And everyone's like, oh, that's brilliant. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and it's, I don't think that's a female or a male thing. And by the way, I didn't maybe fit in so well at Harvard, but one thing I really appreciate and really have taken to heart, that Harvard is hardcore, and most top universities are about intellectual honesty, right? Integrity, provenance of ideas and, and so on. Um, and you can actually get kicked out of school for, for like plagiarism and so on. First of all, I try to support it the other way. If somebody says something, like, being a good assist is really helpful. And whoever it is, whether it's a guy or a woman, says, oh, I'm like, wait a second. Cindy just said something. That was kind of, can you repeat that? That was interesting. Um, I have stood up for myself. When, uh, I got pissed off one time, and somebody later, actually it was two weeks later, I actually felt like they literally stole my idea. And in fact, they had put together a PowerPoint presentation, and when I right-clicked on it, I saw my name as the author. I actually called them on it. I said, oh, great, you took, I see you took my PowerPoint presentation. That's fantastic. Did you want, you want some advice? Because, by the way, it's also got some errors in it. I think you can't let it go. But find allies. You know, if you give, you get. But, um, but also realize, I mean, there's very few truly unique ideas in the world, right? Like, I, you know, someone else somewhere has probably thought about it. Or run with the ball. But don't take it, right? Or maybe you take that person aside later. If you feel like it's that you weren't heard, then I would pile on. After when the person brings it up again, you're like, oh, you heard. Thank you. Yes, this is such a great idea, isn't it? <laughs> I've been thinking this for a while. It's what I just said two hours ago. You know, kind of like in a positive way. And if you find somebody who does that a lot, then that person lacks integrity and should get the hell away from that person. Right? Integrity. And you should, that's something you never want to give up. Your soul your personal reputation, because that's something you own and you can't get it back. We don't value that enough, just like we don't value happiness. Integrity is, well, first of all, integral, if you think about the, root, the word, root of the word. Your values are what you do. And hypocrisy is when what you do doesn't match what you say. Right? And integrity is when those things match. You say early what you're going to do, particularly to people who won't like it. If you only tell people who you think will agree what you're going to do, that's kind of gaming the system, right? You report honestly on how you did and what you did. You learn and you repeat. And then people can trust you. How can you trust somebody if you don't know who they are, what they stand for, how they're going to go about? And I don't mean integrity in a moral sense, and I don't mean trust in a moral sense either. I have a person I work with who I trust because whenever they like something I'm wearing, I know I look like crap. Okay, because I just think their fashion sense is horrifically bad. I just, I am not a purple and pink with sparkly unicorn sweatshirt person. I just don't know what to say. Bless that person's heart. Uh, <laughs> so if you are working with someone who you really suspect lacks integrity, get away. Get away somehow. Can't turn out. Oh, sure. Yeah, go. Um, so can you tell us an incident where you kind of use the concept of feelings are data because women have ovaries and they have emotions and they also have some extra responsibilities than men. So how do you manage your emotions in ever-changing surroundings? Because as and when you grow up, it's not always the same environment you are in. So two years down the line, you might have set some goals, but that kind of changes over time. So how do you manage your emotions with respect to the goals you have? Uh, well, you kind, of, you kind of combined a couple things in there, I think. You talk about emotions, but then also something maybe about family. Well, we all know that 
I believe testicles are ovaries that have changed. Okay, men have emotions too. And by the way, like I remember we're having this debate about should women be in combat positions in the military because they might be distracting to the men. My comment on that was, if there's some guy with his finger on the nuclear button and he's going to be distracted by some chicken camouflage, I don't uh, get, then that's a reason why men should not be in the military. <laughs> and by the way, I think it was tremendously underselling the men who, and women who put their lives on the line for the country. Okay. Um, first of all, men have emotions too. I just think it's, they just handle it differently. When you see yelling or fighting or conflict in a meeting, there's emotion. It's just hidden. And in fact, as you will find, the hardest tech problems are people problems. There's a, a space that's called adaptive problems at Alps. I actually think it might have been one of the professors is at the Harvard Business School. Um, you can go search for it, adaptive leadership. So technical problems are of the kind, there's a bug in the code. You just have to fix the bug in the code. But like, let's say there keep being these kinds of bugs in the code. Maybe it's a design problem. Okay, so then you fix the design. And then there keeps still being these like stupid problems and it just, why? It just seems like it doesn't add up. That's probably a people problem. You have two people that don't like each other, you have people that aren't communicating, you have people with conflicting priorities, and when you're working on very big projects, that happens, right? Two people, three opinions, 20 people, like 400 opinions, okay. Um, so getting to the root of it, I just walk my walk. I will be in a, re a room and I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like it because I remember back, but I admit, back in 1991, we tried this and we cut corners and, and it just did not pan out. So I just lead with it, but then I, I back it with the data. And if I feel like I'm being irrational, I'll just say, you know what, I just hate this. I just hate this in principle. Or I love, I love this. This is so great. And um, I also think referring to principles is helpful and values, right? And principles and values, those are emotional things. Brands, by the way, are emotional things. A good brand is one that makes you buy it in spite of perhaps reality and pay more for it. Harley Davidson, probably one of the best in the business, right? Harley, Harley Davidson doesn't sit there and go, motorcycles for slightly fat ass middle aged accountants, <laughs> right? It's for the rebel inside, right? Okay. So I, I think I just treat it like it's data, it's another piece of fact, right? Oh, I'm not happy. And by the way, social connections matter. If you want to have a team that flies in close formation, it doesn't mean you have to be best friends with everybody you work with, but are you going to go the extra mile for somebody you don't know or somebody you don't like? Probably not, right? You're going to go the extra mile, and when you're under stress and you're falling behind on schedule, you're going to do it for people that you have like this investment in. Um, so on the changing priorities thing, oh, okay, yeah, I didn't really put that up there. You know what? All of you got here by getting an A-plus in everything and managing to like juggle it all, and then new things popped, and you got that done too, and it's just like an ever-increasing whack-a-mole, right? Life is not like that. Priorities are an ordered list, okay, and ordered. And that means when you add something, you insertion sort it in the middle, the thing on the bottom drops off. And this is something women are terrible at doing, and particularly new moms, because new parents, Moms and dad, you feel like you're doing everything terrible. There's this little thing that's crying all the time, and you don't know why. And you're stressed out, and you haven't slept. And then you're trying to get an A-plus at work, you're trying to do all this stuff. It's nonsense. Time is finite. Own your priorities. You will, there is no gradient ascent in your career, okay? When I have ascended to the next highest level peak, I went down a little bit into the side. I went light. I see women do this all the time that have worked for me or that I've worked with where they keep adding to what they're up to, they start doing everything like a little bit less well, they feel bad about it, they feel bad about themselves, and then they feel like, well, I'm falling behind in my career and I won't take an easier job because I can only go up, and they burn out. And that's just not how adventure, ex explore, the history of adventure and mountaineering has gone and that's just not how life goes. There will come times in your life where what you value most is being able to take care of your parent who's really ill. And you're buying that through less time and attention at work. But long term, that makes you a better human being. It makes you richer, more well-rounded. It gives you perspective. And again, success in your career is a long, long-term thing. Okay? And so, so I think, think about that. Like, don't think about this, I can only go up. Right? You can actually travel faster and lighter if you're willing to kind of go downhill a little bit, especially when you're old. Going downhill is really nice. So <laughs> uphill, you know, run a little faster around the side and then go up somewhere else. I also think women don't, they 
you go way too long without giving up. Your average rational, and I'm making gross, you know, sexist exaggerations, but I think this, oh my God, I'm a woman in tech and I don't want to fail, and I'm worried that if I don't succeed, you know, everybody's going to notice and they're going to think women shouldn't be computer scientists. You know, all these, what I would call this mythical thinking, magical thinking. Um, and these are, you have to test these myths. Like if I don't vacuum, the free world is going to end. Guess what, that turns out it doesn't happen. I, I know for a fact, it does. the free world's just fine. I haven't vacuumed in like a month, it's really bad. I've got dust bunnies that are you know, turning into their own life form in the corner of my, my home. So when you, you know, the art of life is knowing what you need to get an A plus in or should get an A plus in, what pass fails fine in, what auditing is fine in. I think like courses. If you went to Brown, this probably makes sense to you because you can graduate from Brown without a grade. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Sorry, a little smack talk. I'm just getting, I'm getting, I'm kind of working my way to getting into March Madness. <laughs> no, one's, no, no one's smart enough to go for Harvard. We'll pick Harvard to go all the way in March Madness. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah or I can, I can repeat your question too. Okay, and what's your name? Annalise. Annalise. Okay, so Annalise said, I talked about my personal values and principles. Can I share some good and bad examples of leadership uh, practices, and particularly anything that maybe I did or didn't do? Um, I'm going to, and I, sometimes I feel like I repeat myself, so apologies. Um, I'm going to give you an example of bad leadership on my part. And it was 35 years ago. So I told you how I moved around a lot, and I was always like this misfit kid. And we were in one place for, I think, four months, which was really long. And I was you know, the weird kid, and there was one other weird kid in this town. Her name was also Laura. So we were friends, OK? <laughs> and uh, but, I mean, but she would just get mocked mercilessly when, in gym class. And you know, we were buddies. And there just was one time we were in gym class, and I was just like tired of getting picked on. And they called her Bug Eyes. And what did I do with my, and this sounds funny, but what did I, what did I do? Okay, I had a moment. I was near a line. And I just kind of stepped over to the other side of the line. It wasn't like, you know, I think bad things are not necessarily like you go from there to there. They're, you just move over a line. And I said, yeah, bug eyes. Like, why do you have such ugly gym clothes? Okay. Two weeks later, she was dead. Her father killed her, her brother, set their house on fire. Okay. All the stuff came out in the paper. She had a horrific life. Okay, her family was poor. That's why she had weird gym clothes. This was somebody, I was her only friend. Okay? She trusted me. And when push came to shove, when she needed me, I did not have her back. And I remember this, and I'm 45. Okay? Those things haunt you. The where you have a choice, and you pick the easy road and not the right road, and you probably know it's right when it seems a little hard and convenient, you know, not convenient. That was bad leadership. Okay? And leadership is sort of the art of influencing and being influenced by other people who don't have to do what you say. Um, on a good management, yeah, I can think of one. I remember working at Windows 95. And uh, man, I like, lived in this building. And we had no idea like, what we were getting ourselves into. And the man who ran, his name's Brad Silverberg. He started Ignition, which was the first mobile event, I mean, wildly successful mobile venture. He would just always make things simple. He worked every day to make, the, we're just doing five things. And we had a ship date that we were working to, towards. And I think in November of 1994, we knew we wanted to ship in the spring of 1995, like nobody wanted to put Windows 95 on their main machine. Because like, it's got bugs, it's going to lose mail and stuff. And he goes, we can't sell this to customers if we don't run it. And he said, I know it's buggy, but the way we're going to fix the bugs is we're going to, I mean, and everyone was like whining about it. He made us put it on our machines, probably took three months until we were like comfortable, and we slipped the date. And there was a lot of money behind it. There were marketing campaigns, office was lined up, they had TV ads ready to run, the Rolling Stones were just waiting to hear, you know, like, go start doing Start Me Up. So there were hundreds of millions of dollars at the time tied to this date. So the pressure was immense. And he had his, went back to his principles, and he said, look, we're going to ship something we're proud of, and we can't be, if we're, if, if we're not running it ourselves, then we're probably not proud of it. So how the hell could we possibly sell this to customers? So I'd say that would be a, a good example. Um, but I, I kind of like to leave with the bad ones on my side. Um, another one sometimes is I just, I get annoyed and I get bored in meetings. Like, I'm like, I've heard this before probably 52 times. <laughs> but I also know that 
people need to think it out for themselves. That is how you win the peace in a group setting, you know, bringing people along in a journey. So sometimes bad leadership on my part is I'm like, yeah, 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 got it. Can we like jump to the end? And forgetting that actually having people come with you or work it out themselves is what gets, makes for a, a stronger force and a stronger bond, right? Instead of, it's much different. Like if I tell you to do something, it's so much more different than if you come to that conclusion yourself, right? Like I know my mom would be like, okay, clean your room. You know, you almost don't want to do it, right? But if you decide, ah, oh, I'm stubbing my toe for the eighth time on books on the floor, okay, I'm going to pick it up. It's just skin in the game. It's just so, so different. Oh, hi, yeah. Uh, you talked about uh, creating things that we want to make. So I was wondering what the first thing you created was um, and also how you improved your coding skills personally. Ah, okay, so I'm sorry, what's your name? Mathingi. Mathingi. Okay, so she said, so I talked a lot, you know, about making things you want to use. What's the first thing that I made, and then how have I improved my, how did I go about improving my coding skills? What was the first thing that I made that I wanted? Honestly, it was the 2.5D and Windows 95. I just hated the flat, I used to get confused all the time, like what window was in the front, and I hated the menus, you had to click a lot to like get to stuff. So we were just playing around with that. And I, and like the way the menu behavior was where you could just move the mouse and it would just cascade. Cause I was just annoyed. That was probably the first thing, maybe 1992 that I, I mean, this is before the apps era. Now I have a whole long list. I've been talking about making an umbrella with a cup holder, for example, for 20 years now. Cause if you go to Seattle, you know, it rains a lot. Okay. Nobody uses umbrellas. Why? One hand, latte. Other hand, Nordstrom shopping bag. How are you going to hold an umbrella? Umbrella with a cup holder. Seems obvious, right? Okay, like I'm not going to do that now. Um, in terms of improving my coding skills, you know, first of all, working with really great programmers is like the best way that you get better. And it's intimidating, right? But uh, the other one is, honestly, get into the deep end. I, I was very fortunate that I started, when I started in Windows, it was, I did everything. I mean, from assembly code, like thunks, for performance on fast send message to, um, to uh, UX problems. I mean, I really was in this sort of breadth role. And, and it helped because everybody knew, oh, I've got a deadlock. Go, you know, call Laura in the company to be like, oh, okay, bang, 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 you know, bang, blah, 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 and win debug. Oh, yeah, well, you just called wait for, sing you know, wait for single object with infinity on a message pump thread. You can't do that. So I think it was really the variety of, like, getting exposed to a lot of things that worked for me, but that's an operating systems, lower level group. The other way to go would be to go deep, like deep on a scenario. I don't know about you, I love to read, but I don't understand if, until I get my hands on it. And actually the root of tech, technology, techne, manual, epistemy, theoretical knowledge, techne, practical knowledge. So I learned by doing. So I think making an app top to bottom and then writing it again, and then, you know, doing perf analysis and stuff like that, and then comparing against other similar things in, in, you know, the market is a good way to go, and talking to people. You know, to a point, you can kind of drown, like reading all these things on Stack Overflow and open source, blah, 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 blah. But, like, that's how I would get better. And then nothing, nothing compares to then you have your beautiful masterpiece. And then, like, when you have a startup, for example, and then you show it to the first angel investor, and they go, huh, yeah, if only I added a gold faucet, I could use it as a sink. And then you go back to the drive, you know, and then you do that, and then you show it to the next person who's like, you know, if only you added a towel, it could be a bathtub. And then you kind of go through this, like, loop, and then you have to kind of find your center. Um, but also customers, right? Like, when you write gorgeous code, and this is where user interface is so frustrating to kernel-type developers, because gorgeous code, low level, it's like all beautifully symmetrical, and it's in nice boxes, and and like it's on, you know, thread scheduling, and, uh, and it's horrible user interface. It's called DOSBox or command prompt, okay? Users hate that stuff, but it lines up so nice. Excel, everything lines up so nice. So you show it to users, and like, this is completely, like, crazy hard to use. Like, I have to navigate, like, 82 menus. So I think getting real-world feedback is also quite helpful, right? I think just do. Try variety, work on a bunch of stuff. Okay, I'm going to go here, and then I'm going to go to the front. Hi. Hi. So if you love 
love tech, but you're not the best programmer and coding isn't your favorite thing. Is your career or like your set of path for becoming someone like you doomed? Okay, so Tarlin? Yeah. It's okay, so Tarlin said, well, I'm not the best programmer or coder, and then... But you want to, you look up for two women like you. Is your career kind of ah. doomed if you're not... Oh, uh, so is your career doomed if you're not techie? Yeah. First of all, I was the best programmer. I got an A plus in theory of computation, <laughs> Harry Lewis. Um, I was a phenomenal coder. It's just that I got to a point where... I, well, actually, here's how I became a manager. Maybe that, that, that will kind of lead into this. Um, my manager left, and they were looking for somebody, and those of us that were encoding heaven, you know, you're not in meetings, it's fantastic, you own your time, it's delightful. They couldn't find anybody, and at the same time, we were like in danger of our project being canceled. And so I got guilted into it because like, we needed somebody who was credible, who knew the code and knew the thing really, really well. This was um, NetMeeting, which was sort of like the great-great-grandmother of Skype. Okay. And by the way, like, we still, to this day, it blows me away 20 years later. Like, can you hear me? Can you hear me? You know, getting all this stuff set up. Nothing's changed. Um, and I found, well, I knew the code really well, so, but that I cared about how the team operated. I didn't realize that. Um, and then dev manager is an easier job in a way. When you become your first dev lead, a tech lead, you're supposed to, like, everyone assumes you're going to do all the same coding you were doing before, and then you're going to do another, like, 40 hours a week of this other stuff, and people drown. When you get to be a dev manager, you have kind of backup. You know, be, you become more of a, I want to say, an Olympic decathlete instead of a gold medalist in one sport. I'm not the best sprinter anymore, and now I'm too old anyway. <laughs> sprinter, I'm not the best pole vaulter, I'm not the best hurdler, but I'm really good at all of those things, so I'm the decathlete medalist, but it's great. I know I've got the guy or the gal. Um, who can, is like world class. Um, so yeah, there is. I mean, I think, like, I would not be able to make good judgments if I didn't understand the subject matter, but I also don't feel that I've, I need to go show how techy smart I am now. I did, when I was early in my career, become, a, you know, as a subject matter expert, but now I'm comfortable. So really, the reason why I'm doing what I'm doing now, and by the way, digging into, like, battery issues <laughs> on mobile as part of Windows Fundamentals is really hard, it's the judgment and the wisdom and the building the team that will solve the category of problem, which feels just like coding to me. It's just what I'm doing now. But I would not be effective in my job if I was like, you know, PowerPoint compiling. So, you know, don't, if you invent a PowerPoint compiler, you're going to put everybody else out of a job. You know, architecture, where you put some bullets on a PowerPoint slide and miraculously it turns into code. So I still make things. I think text about making things. It doesn't have to be in software. It could be hardware. It could be robots. It could be Legos. It could be cooking, right? Making something. And I make things. I just don't make a lot of code anymore. And also, I, I, every once in a while, like once a year, or every so often, I'll do my ceremonial thing. Like I remember I did a tiny feature four years ago. It was like, if, uh, you think, if there was DRM content attached to a piece of mail, it would IRM the mail, something like that. Or you wouldn't be able to take a screen snapshot. Okay, and it was probably about five lines. And this thing sat in code reviews for two weeks because everybody and their brother decided this is their chit, you know. And how I conducted myself was important. I had to take everybody's feedback. Or I'll like fix the build break. I'd like to do that because sometimes I'm up when the build's broken and you know, it keeps it real. Oh, who fixed the build? Oh, Laura fixed the build break, you know. But I, I pick and choose my moments now. I, what I learned is like I used to do that more than I probably should have. And it actually caused two or three problems that I never thought of. Number one, if you're the manager of a group and you're taking on the most fun tasks, who are you going to get to work for you and stay? Right? Like, the smart people are going to be like, well, like, that person's eating all, you know, eating all the good food. Like, I'm out of here. And second, it can be very hard for very junior people to give you honest feedback, like your code sucks. You create this distortion because of a power imbalance. So I kind of learned my lesson on that. But I have my own little like pet projects, like little apps and stuff. I don't claim they're any good. Oh, sorry, there were some ladies over here, and then I'll come over here. And then I'll get cut off when you tell me it's time. Okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, um, so you mentioned okay. multiple instances where you jump into work or jobs where nobody else wanted to work with. Um, how do you justify applying your skills and time onto problems that you, you don't really care about, I guess? Oh. <laughs> That's a great question. Sorry, what's your name? My name's Faye. Faye. Okay, so Faye was saying, so I've jumped into a lot of things that were like, they were big messes and so on, but how do I 
motivate myself in stuff that I don't care about. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, you know, we talk about work-life balance a lot. I don't think about work-life balance. I think about fun chore balance. Okay? I have fun things and chore things in my personal life. Fun, go to Seattle International Film Festival. Chore, vacuum. I have fun things at work. Ooh, you know, mixer, or I'm going to go do a presentation, and it's like totally awesome. I feel great about it. Chore, expense reports. I'm going to have to go fill out an expense report when I get back from this thing, and I'm like, oh, God, I hate receipts. Okay. Um, so I find a balance. Um, if I'm bought into the bigger mission of the thing, like I see potential, I would not sign on to a mess that, I didn't, that wasn't in a space that I didn't care about or where I couldn't see that if I cleaned it up, like I could do something that like I have in my mind. I have like, world domination plans. I have Microsoft domination plans. I pick the job I have right now because it sits in the middle of everything, so I can genetically modify. If you want to mutate an organism, you know, be in the circulation system. So I can see the potential. Like everyone else saw this like broken down old house with peeling paint. I saw this two acres of property in downtown Manhattan where coat of paint and bringing it up to code and the thing's gonna be worth a fortune. But I, I get back to like the mission, like what is it that I'm doing like, and how is that gonna help? That's how I motivate myself. Um, and if I can't do that, well I tend not to sign on to those things now. Sometimes you don't know, but I, you, can't, you can't fake it. I think that's the thing, like you can't fake passion. Oprah says fake it till you make it. That's really more for, you know, when you have these days where you're like, I just, everything's going wrong, like am I a total idiot? I don't know what I'm doing to tide you over. Um, and I take comfort also in that, well, my management are the ones that promoted me and put me in this spot. So like, they're bigger idiots. If I like screw up, they're even stupider because they're the ones who put me here. <laughs> um, so I try to find balance. Like I try to find, how, or I make it fun. That's the thing. Actually, one of the arts of being successful is to find the things that must be done and turn them, make them as enjoyable and easy as possible. And also how you talk about it. If I say uh, thread, contention on the GPU, you just like want to stick a needle in your eye. Right? If I say gaming performance, like, you know, just the language you use, you really can kind of change it. Uh, you can make almost anything interesting. It's like all human beings are interesting uh, to, to lesser and greater degrees. <laughs> okay, I thought there maybe were a couple more questions over here and then here. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, how much more time? Three minutes. Okay, so one here and one here and then I, anybody wants to come talk to me after, feel free. Second-guessed your abilities, or look back at your previous accomplishments and thought maybe I might or might ha might not have deserved the credit that ah. I'm given. Yeah. So Melissa says, "Have I ever second-guessed myself, or have I ever looked back and said I don't deserve the credit?" Um, I second-guess my my decisions all the time uh, inside, and I actually will wallow for a while, like I don't sleep. But once I make a decision, I move on. I need to carry it. And what gives me confidence there is my mom. I mean, we literally lived on the street for a while. My mom was like flat. Like, when I say broke, I mean really broke. And, but she always knew that working and trying would give you dignity. And to this day, I'm like, if I have to work at McDonald's to pay my mortgage, I will. There's dignity in work. And it's easy to not try, but you can't succeed, right? In fact, it's easier sometimes, because you never have to like, come to a test of success or failure. And I hated that. I used to see a couple of people like that on my floor at Harvard. We're like, oh yeah, like, I didn't really go to class, and then I crammed for the final, and I'm so proud of myself that I got a B without even trying. And I sit there and I go, that's a cop-out, isn't it? Because then you never have to sit there and go, well, I really tried, threw my heart into it, and I only got a B. I gave it my all, and it still did, was not an A. Um, I know I don't deserve anything. Anything. I mean, by the way, like, there are people who are changing the world in small, in countries that are like, you know, have disease and like don't have electricity who aren't getting paid enough. No, none of us in the tech industry deserve the money that we're making. Hard stop. We do not deserve it. Okay? All you can do is try to earn it. Earn it by changing the world in a good way, paying it forward, and so on. There's tons of things I would do different. But also, ultimately what I do is I think about how I felt when I was young and, and I see and when I felt like people weren't listening to me or taking my ideas. I try to go out of my way to give credit. And frankly, managers don't do this enough. I get to bask in the glory of being the incredible genius who hired an even smarter person to work for me. I can be big enough. In fact, I say it's a mark of a small person when they don't share credit. 
right? The, I mean, think about you know, like the crappy third world dictators you know about who like don't have sense of humor about themselves. There's nothing smaller to me. You've just shown me, you know, Saddam Hussein or uh, Kim Jong Il, you know, that like you really are a small person because someone put a poster of you up and you're upset about it, right? A big person wouldn't would just roll off their back. Okay, and then you guys, and then I think that's it. All right, um, Lana. What makes you happy? Luana, what makes me happy? When the people around me are happy and when there's a hum. Uh, and when I feel like I've brought order or clarity to the universe in some way, because entropy is the natural order, you know, thermodynamics. Um, when I feel like collectively we're better together, why have 200 people and be a holding company? When the sum is greater than the parts. And when I get to MacGyver and maybe Malcolm Gladwell ask, bring a different perspective to a problem that people have been beating their head against the wall on for 10 years. And I'm like, if you just snuck around the back, you know, like almost, I would say guy style, apologies, but like, we're going to take the citadel by siege warfare and flinging cannonballs at the front, trebuchet, trebuchet. And I'm like, well, like, I'm just going to go around the back and maybe strike up a conversation with the kitchen, with the chef in the kitchen. Hey, oh, what are you making? Oh, great. Hey, do you need some help carrying in the dough? And then I'm just inside the fortress. You know, by looking at it a different way, that also makes me extra happy. <laughs> and also MacGyver, like doing it lean on a shoestring, like with some dental floss and, you know, and like a toothbrush and, and, a, and a screwdriver. And everyone else is like, well, I don't know how we're going to fix the battery. But I'm like, just, duh. <laughs> OK, last question. Uh, how do you deal with failure and ah. right after Ah, okay, so Sarah says, how do you deal with failure? How do you keep confidence? Oh, man. First of all, remember, even mama hyenas think baby hyenas are wonderful and beautiful. Okay? You've got to find that group of people who love you. Okay? And that's actually something I try to bring to my team. And by love, I mean unconditional acceptance. Who you are, whoever you are, is okay. You're a member of the tribe, and your membership of ship of being in the tribe is not tied to some hourly or daily evaluation of you as a stock price. Okay, and that fam members of a family try to make each other better versions of who they are, but not different versions. Okay, so I try that in a team setting because it's crazy impactful, right? It creates an environment for the people who work for me to try things that don't turn out because they're not. You're banished off with your head. Um, find that group of people around you. Um, I think also you got to learn how to hold your head up high. By the way, running on hills on a treadmill helps, or like kicking a, a punching bag helps. Um, and I think practice. It gets easier. And also, I hope, like small failures, I hope I'm the first person in my team to say, oh, I was totally wrong. In fact, last night, late last night, I have this thing I call the buddy program. Once a month, people in my team get randomly matched up with somebody else that they don't normally talk to or see. It's almost like a brokered party introduction. It's just about wiring up the neurons of the brain. There's no direct work benefit from it. Okay? But I make it work, and so people will do it. And I left somebody off the list. And I get this like, mail back in like two minutes going, uh, have I like, been fired or something? <laughs> okay, so what I, do, what I did is I like last night, I think it was about just before midnight, I reply all to the whole team, and I say, hey, I had some errors. And by the way, I had a little spreadsheet. I've added some fixing, you know, some tracking macros. I had a bug. I fixed my bug. Thanks so much for catching this. Like, you, should, you guys should never assume that there's any smart secret intent behind anything I do if it doesn't make sense. You should assume that I'm just stupid, like, or that I just missed something. So I think also just by removing the stress around failure, like, or around error, it helps a lot. And, you know, trying. I just really believe this. And there was a James Bond movie, and it was like the most annoying. Remember, uh, was it Chris, Dr. Christmas Jones, the nuclear scientist? Okay? And it was, uh, the world is not enough. Okay? It was like so terrible. It's like the worst movie. I, I wanted my money back. It was so bad. Anyway, nuclear scientist. And it was Denise Richards, who I'm sure is a lovely lady, but let's just say she's not getting a PhD from MIT. Okay. Uh, anyway, there's like, I think there was a nuclear bomb, and it's in Istanbul Harbor. And, okay, and it's ticking down. They've got five minutes, and they're trapped on this submerged submarine. And James Bond's about to go, like, try to find it and defuse it. And she goes, don't go, James. Don't go. It's dangerous. And my jaw dropped. I went, a nuclear bomb is about to go off in five minutes. 100% guarantee you'll be human jello in five minutes. Like, what's the downside of trying to find the thing and defuse it, right? Like, 
like put it in perspective, right? <laughs> so I think about that too. Like I have confidence in my passion, in my ability to try, and that I, I will try. I, if you work for me, I will do everything humanly and beyond possible to help you be successful, to help us to be successful. I will have your back. I will grow you. I will teach you. And this is not some pitch from Microsoft. And um, I, and that's the confidence that I bring. And that I will do anything necessary. Like, I am a border collie in leadership style. If I have to be in the back, I have to be in the middle, I have to be in the front, I have to run circles, I have to drag the sheep on my back, not to say that the people who work for me are mutton, but, you know, I will. And I will empty the trash cans. We actually, I think, I, we do a weekly pulse on the team. And uh, the single biggest thing that came back was that the recycle bins weren't being emptied often enough, and they were piling up. And people felt really upset because they were throwing stuff in the trash. I call facilities. We just get an extra charge. We get, actually, I emptied recycle bins myself for two weeks until we could get it started. It was just not that big a deal. It's not, nothing's beneath me. You know, Mark Zuckerberg, every week, goes into a town hall forum. Okay? He's one of the you know, most successful people on the planet. It is not beneath him to roll up his sleeves. Okay? It's not beneath me to do whatever is needed that's ethical to help our team be successful. So that's where my confidence comes from. And also, look at me. I look ridiculous. I mean, if I can do it, anybody can do it, right? I think that also helps the people around me. They're like, ah, oh, Laura says it's no big deal. It's got to be easy. <laughs> All right, thanks, guys.